How would you like to be called foolish by the Lord Jesus Christ? If you were on the receiving end of the words of Jesus and he said, you fool, well, that would be hard to receive, wouldn't it? But that's exactly what a couple of discouraged Jewish disciples received. They were walking, presumably walking home, thinking this whole Christian thing was just a sham. They were walking to a village called Emmaus, and they thought that the Messiah was a failure because he died. And do you remember the story? This is the end of Luke's gospel. Jesus comes, but he doesn't reveal himself, and he comes, and he starts talking to them, and he tells them, as they say, we thought that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. We thought he was the one to redeem Israel, and he's dead now, and so we're going home. And Jesus says, oh, how foolish you are. He says, oh, slow to believe all that the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms have spoken. It's another way of saying the whole Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he went and showed them that you should have known that the Messiah would die and be raised from the law and from the prophets and from the Psalms. And you're foolish, he says, because you didn't know that. In another place in the Gospel of John, he's speaking to the Jewish leaders and again, the scribes and Pharisees, they knew their Old Testaments really, really well. And he says, you study the scriptures diligently and you miss the whole point. Jesus says, they testify about me. And you missed it. We're going to see this morning that Peter agrees. <laughs> he didn't always agree, but Peter now, after the resurrection and after going back and reading his Bible, he agrees that all of scripture is about Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. And remember from last week, if you were here, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 12 is actually all one long sentence. So this morning, we're still just unpacking what we looked at last week with that main verb in verse 3 being praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who've preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Let's look at eight ways that the prophets speak here from these three verses. Eight ways. Number one, they speak. Number two, they speak concerning this salvation. Number three, they spoke of the grace that was to come to us. Number four, they eagerly anticipated the revealing of this grace. Number five, they were moved by the Spirit of Christ. Number six, they predicted the sufferings of the Messiah. Seven, the glories that would follow. And finally, eighth, they spoke to serve us. We'll rush through all, most of these and dig down a little deeper, dive into a couple of them in more depth. So praise God. Still, that's what we're thinking. Verse three, praise God because he sent prophets who spoke. I think we can often take this for granted because we are in the West and Christianity is so popular, but think about other religions, other world religions. Other world religions, many of the so-called gods have left their people in the dark, not our God. He's the God who is there and he's the God who speaks. And one of the ways he has spoken to us is through his prophets. We serve a God who hasn't left us in the dark, but has revealed himself through his word. And he started doing that through prophets. I want to read from Deuteronomy 18. Uh, a passage about the beginning of the institution of the prophetic office. Let me read Deuteronomy 18, verse 14. Tells us how we will be different as the people of God. The nations, in other words, the pagans, those that aren't the people of God, the nations you will dispossess, they listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses says, from among you, from your fellow servants. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore or we will die. 
the Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their fellow Israelites, and I'll put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. So we have have the kindness of the Lord condescending to us. The people were afraid to hear the voice of the Lord. And so God institutes this office, this institution of prophets. And he speaks through prophets. Notice it's his words through them. And so we should praise God that we have the word of God through his prophets. Second thing about these prophets is they spoke, they prophesied concerning this salvation. Look at verse 10 again, 1 Peter 1.10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets prophesied. Well, what salvation? Well, the salvation he just talked about in verses 3 and following, the fact that we've been given new birth. We've been given this change from the inside. We've been regenerated. We've been given a fresh start, new life. This salvation, the prophet spoke of it. And he talked about being given new birth to a living hope, a hope that won't die. And so the prophet spoke of this living hope. And then also the inheritance, which the prophet spoke of, our eternal home, our eternal dwelling place with the Lord. So the prophet spoke and the prophet spoke concerning this salvation. Third thing, notice the prophet spoke of the grace that was to come to us there in verse 10. I love the way that's worded. The message of the prophets, again, we're talking Old Testament prophets, most of the Bible, the message of the prophets was the message of grace. The message of a holy God who had every right to wipe us out gives us a second chance. Not only that, a third chance and a fourth chance and on and on and on. The story of the creator is of God condescending, stooping down to us rebels and bearing with us. And he enters his own creation. He enters history and he redeems us through Christ. We deserve nothing but judgment. But in grace, God promises to come and restore and save his people. So the prophets spoke the message of scripture, which is salvation by grace. Fourth thing, notice the prophet's eagerly anticipated the revealing of this grace. Look again at 1 Peter 1.10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted what would come. And so they searched intently and with greatest care care. They're trying to find out when and where would all this happen? When would the Messiah come? When would God fulfill his promises? So they searched, they inquired, they investigated, they longed to know. They asked, how long, O Lord? They anticipated the fulfillment of God's promises. Their lives weren't focused on them and their own kingdom. They didn't focus on the here and now. They were focused on the there and then and what God would do when he brought his kingdom. That's what they were consumed with. They eagerly anticipated the grace they were speaking about. Fifth thing, notice it was the spirit of Christ moving in them. There in verse 11, they were trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing them. It's the spirit of Christ that was working in the Old Testament prophets, Peter tells us, which makes sense, right? We believe that Jesus of Nazareth, the, the Christ, is the second, second person of the Trinity. He's always existed. He's always been at work. And so here we learn he was at work in the prophets, moving them to write what they wrote. They were moved along by the spirit of Christ. They were just mere men, right? The prophets were just mere men. They were just mere people just like us. That's what James says. Talking about Elijah, he's just a human being, even as, we, even as we are, but it was the Spirit of Christ moving through them so that they would write ultimately what Christ wanted them to write. That's what Scripture is. Scripture is written by humans, but ultimately God breathed. There's a dual authorship of Scripture. In fact, we see that. Flip over to 2 Peter 1, just to the right there a couple of pages. And we see Peter say much the same in chapter 1, verse 19. Second Peter 1.19, we also have the prophetic message, the message of the prophets, as something completely reliable. 
and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, no prophecy, came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Verse 21, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's what Scripture is. It is human authors being moved by the Spirit of God to produce a text that is a God-breathed text. And so even the prophets, they were moved along by the Spirit of Christ. Sixth thing we learn here is the prophets predicted the sufferings of the Messiah. Look again at verse 11. Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Messiah, it just means king. It means the anointed one. It's the anointed king. And so the story of Scripture really is when is the king going to come? When is the Savior King going to come? There are so many themes that really tie the story of Scripture. We looked at the story of the Lamb a few weeks ago, if you were here, from Genesis to Revelation. The same thing with the theme of kingship. So the question of the Old Testament, when is the Messiah going to come? Another way to say that is, when is the King going to come? The whole story is, when is he coming? In fact, it starts in Genesis 3.15, first few chapters of the Bible. Adam and Eve sin, things go terribly wrong, but God promises that there will be an offspring, this royal offspring of the woman who will defeat the offspring of the serpents. And so the question right then is, when's this one going to come? When is this royal offspring who will defeat evil? When will he be here? They thought it was right away, but it wasn't. And then you move down the storyline and God could have wiped everything out. He did, but he saved a family. He didn't have to, but he did. And he saved Noah. And then from Noah comes Abram, and Abraham has promised those grand promises that his family would grow and all the nations of the world, not just Abraham's family, but all the nations of the world would be blessed through the offspring of Abraham. That's Genesis 12 and following. And in Genesis 17, 6, we read that God would make Abraham very fruitful. Nations would come from him, not just one nation, but nations would ultimately be included in the family of Abraham. And Genesis 17, 6 says, long before there was a king, it says, kings will come from you, Abraham. So the question now is, when is this offspring, when is this king coming, this king that would ultimately be part of the family of Abraham? And you move along in the story, and in Genesis 35, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob is promised that he now would be fruitful and that kings would be among his descendants. So when is the king coming? Then we see at the very end of Genesis, Judah. Judah is told that the scepter, the royal scepter, would not depart from him. And the obedience, not just of Abraham's family, but of the nations, would be his. When is this universal king going to come? When is the Messiah who will rule going to be here? And then in the law, we, we read just now, we read Deuteronomy 18. A chapter before, let me read Deuteronomy 17. Again, remember in the story of Scripture, there are no kings. This is the giving of the law. The nation has just been formed. There are no kings, but God knows kings are coming. So notice what God says he wants his king to be like in Deuteronomy 17. It's actually quite simple. First he starts with what he's not, and then he finishes with what he is. Deuteronomy 17, 14. When you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving giving you, and you've taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Sound like a prophet, doesn't it? Do not place a foreigner over you, one who's not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you're not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Sounds like Solomon, doesn't it? Another sermon for another time. Verse 18, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he's to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord as God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. And then he, 
and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. In other words, he's to be a man of the book. He's to make a copy of the Bible and read the Bible and live the Bible out. Then we have Joshua moving along the story of Scripture. Then we have Judges. And the Judges were sort of like kings. They were like these mini rulers. And you know the story of Judges. If you know the Bible, it's pretty bleak. And then at the very last verse of the book of Judges, here's what we read in Judges 21, 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And so the question is still, when is this Messiah coming? When is this Deuteronomy 17 king going to come? Because we haven't seen him. And then Saul becomes the first king of Israel. He's not a Deuteronomy 17 man. Then moving along, you have the history books. And in 2 Samuel 7, you have God picking a king, an unlikely king, not the one who's big and strong and handsome, but the shepherd boy. David becomes the king. And God makes these promises to David in 2 Samuel 7 that his name will be revered for all of history and that from him a king would come whose kingdom wouldn't be temporary, wouldn't be defeated, but would last forever. And so now the question is, when will this king in the line of David come? That's the story of the most of the Bible is when is David coming back? And so there's all these prophets speaking and even stories that are in there really just to show that the line continues. Think about the book of Ruth. Book of Ruth is a great story. You have this, this really a pagan girl who turns out to be an awesome daughter-in-law, and so she takes care of her mother-in-law, and this really good Jewish man named Boaz that comes and redeems her, marries her, and is able to continue to provide for them. And there's lots in there. It's four chapters. Really cool story. You know, the main point of the story of Ruth is the very last verse, or towards the end, where it says that Boaz was the father of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. The point of the book of Ruth is the line of David moves on. The king is going to come, but when will he come? When is this son of David going to come? When is the king coming? And so the prophets say that he's coming. He's going to come. You have all these psalms, these messianic psalms about this coming king in the line of David. So Psalm 2 says not only will he be a king, he'll be a son. So Psalm chapter 2, verse 6 says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. When is this king going to come? Psalm 72 says the king will come and rule not just over Israel, but will rule from sea to sea. Not just in one little strip, but he'll rule over all the nations, this king. Not just one. And all the nations will be blessed through this king who's also in the line of Abraham. Remember those promises. Then Psalm 89 says that God will establish the line of David forever and he'll make his throne firm through all generations. The prophet Ezekiel, long after David was dead, says this. He'll put his servant king David over his people and they will, be his, they will rule and he will rule over them and be their shepherd. So again, the question the prophets ask is, when is this king coming? When is this Messiah coming in the line of David? The prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, speaks of one who will be born and the government will be on his shoulders. He prophesies that of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He'll reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forevermore. And then he says that this king will come from the line of David. There will be a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. David's dad, in the future, and the spirit will rest on him. The prophet Jeremiah prophesies the same thing. He says in in Jeremiah 23, 5, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. So the prophets, Peter says, spoke of the coming king. The message of the prophets is the Messiah is coming. The Old Testament is written from a messianic perspective to nourish messianic hope. And friends, we have a privileged perspective because what the prophets predicted has come to fulfillment. And we get to be on this side of it all. That's why the first verse of the first book of our New Testament says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the King, son of Abraham, son of David. 2 Timothy 2.8 says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. 
Christ is not a last name. Christ is an honorific title. That's why some translations now are saying Messiah or one I read recently. Anytime you have Christ Jesus, it translates it King Jesus. And that's accurate. He is the king. They spoke of the coming king. We've seen it. But notice, though, Peter doesn't just say the, the Messiah's coming. He says the sufferings of the Messiah. Look again there, 1 Peter 1. Verse 11, they were trying to find out the, the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah. And what the Jewish people at the time couldn't imagine was a king that would suffer. They just had no categories. They couldn't imagine a Messiah who would die, even though it was clear enough. Peter, as we're going to see as we move forward, he loved Isaiah, and he loved especially the song of the servants. And this is crystal clear, the fact that this Messiah will be one who's going to suffer, not for suffering's sake, but he's going to suffer on our behalf. And so we read in Isaiah 53, 800 years before Christ come, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested he was cut off from the land of the living? For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring, prolong, prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after he has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. They were rightly expecting a king, but they missed the part of the story said that, that said this king would ultimately reign from a cursed tree. This is why the disciples are so confused too in the Gospels, and especially Peter. You remember the time Jesus said that I, it is written, I must suffer, Jesus says, and be raised from the dead? You remember what Peter does? He, he takes them and pulls them aside. I can just see Jesus is teaching that I'm going to suffer. That's how I'm going to bring my kingdom. My kingdom comes through a cross. And Peter's like, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus, can I get a minute? Takes him aside. That, that's not how it works. You're the king. And Jesus says, you remember what he says? Get behind me, Satan, for you don't know the plans of God. What Peter once rejected, he now glories in. He had to go back and reread his Bible after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because the prophet spoke, not only of the coming king, the coming Messiah, but the sufferings of the Messiah. But that's not all. What else did they speak of? Look there at verse 11. There at the end. They predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. They predicted not only the suffering death of Christ, but the glories that would come, the subsequent glories. And notice that pattern. It's a pattern we need to own. Suffering, then glory. That's the pattern of Christ, and therefore that's the pattern of the Christian life. For us, it is suffering, and only then is it glory. We see that in 1 Peter 2. Flip over a page at chapter 2, verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. The pattern of Christ is suffering. 
and then glory and exaltation. And friends, that's what we need to expect in our lives. This life will be hard. Life's not really going to get good until then. Your best life is not now. It's later. So the prophets prophesied of the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. And man, there is a lot to say. What did the prophets prophesy in terms of glories? There's a lot of glory we could talk about that they predicted. But I just want to highlight four that several prophets highlighted. What are these glories that would come about as a result of the suffering of the Messiah? What would he bring about? What did the prophets talk about? And one is a new and more glorious exodus. In Ultimate Testament times, if you would ask anybody, what is the greatest thing God's ever done? They might say creation first, second, the exodus. That's where God saved his people. Remember, they were enslaved under Egypt, and God saves them, splits the Red Sea, forms them as a nation, and the exodus was this defining moment for Israel, which is why we've already seen Peter quote from Exodus 19 and 24. We'll see more of that. It was this foundational event. And what the prophets begin to say, though, is something new is needed. Because think about the history of Israel. They stayed in exile. They were free for a little bit, but if it wasn't Egypt, then it was Assyria, Babylon, and then it was Persia. And at the time of the Bible, it was Rome. And so the question the prophets were saying, when are we going to be free? We've had these rulers. Where's the king going to come and set his people free? We need a new exodus. And so the prophet Isaiah, especially in chapters 40 and following, repeatedly says, God's going to come back. He's going to defeat your enemies. He's going to make a way, and he's going to bring about a new exodus. They were under enslavement in Babylon, but what we learn is we don't need freedom from Rome. We need freedom from the enemy that stands back of Rome. That is Satan, sin, and death. So Jesus is the one who brings about the new exodus. Anytime you see the word redemption or redeem, that's the language we're talking about is exodus. Remember the transfiguration of Jesus? He's there and he's transfigured and he's speaking with Moses and Elijah. And they, Luke tells us there in chapter 9 that they were speaking of his departure that he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. What was Jesus about to accomplish in Jerusalem? The cross. And that little word departure, your Bible probably has a footnote, Luke 9.31. Bottom of your Bible, it will say Greek, Exodus. Moses and Elijah and Jesus were talking about the Exodus that Jesus was about to accomplish at Jerusalem again. Not that we need freedom from Rome. We need freedom from Satan, sin, and death. And so the prophet spoke of this new and glorious exodus that Jesus brings about. What other glories? Well, the, the prophet spoke of the glory of a new and more glorious temple. The temple was where God dwelled. Of course, God's present everywhere, but the temple was this place where God especially dwelled. It was where heaven and earth overlapped. That's why the ark is the footstool of the Lord. He's in the heavens, but his feet are on earth. So the temple was this special place where God dwelt with his people. In many ways, the Garden of Eden was the first special dwelling place. God was there with his people. They sinned. Adam and Eve were supposed to guard that garden temple, but they get kicked out from it, and now the garden temple is guarded from them. And then moving along the storyline, that's Genesis. Look at Exodus. You have the building of the tabernacle, sort of this temporary tent, temporary temple where God would come and especially meet with his people. And then moving along the storyline, you have First and Second Samuel and the building of the temple and the glory cloud comes down and dwells in that first temple. But then you have yet more sin and idolatry and, and they're kicked out of the land and ultimately that temple is desecrated. And Ezekiel speaks of the glory of the Lord leaving that temple. So the question then is when is the temple going to be rebuilt where the king is going to be? And bring about this new exodus. And so finally they are brought back to the lands. And they begin to rebuild the temple, right? Ezra and Nehemiah. But the glory cloud never returns to that temple. And in fact, Ezra 3.12 says that those that were elderly that saw the building of that new temple, they didn't celebrate. They didn't clap. They wept aloud. Because they knew that that temple had nothing compared to the former temple. Something was missing until the prophets begin to speak of a new temple that's going to come. God's going to come back and dwell with his people. Ezekiel has chapter 40 to 48 talking about this new temple that's going to come. God's going to come and dwell among his people again. Haggai, the prophet Haggai in chapter 2 says that the glory of the future temple will be greater than the glory of the former house. So the prophets predicted a new glorious temple. And then you have John chapter 1, first chapter of the gospel. Jesus enters John 1.14, the word came and dwelt among us. Word for dwell there is the Greek word skenao, 
It's the Greek word for tabernacle. Jesus comes and tabernacles among us. He is now the temple. He is now where heaven and earth overlap. He is the presence of God on earth. So much so that in the next chapter, in John 2, he can say, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. He is the temple. He is the special dwelling place of God. He's where the presence of God is found. But he leaves. He's ascended. He's exalted to the right hand of God, but he doesn't leave us alone. The glory cloud descends in Acts chapter 2, and the Spirit of God now indwells us so that 2 Corinthians 6 can say, we are the temple of the living God. Then the end of the story in the New Jerusalem, John tells us in Revelation, there will be no temple because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So the prophet spoke of a new and glorious temple. The third glory is a new and glorious temple priesthood. We saw in Leviticus the form of the king, the forming of the prophets. There was also the forming of the priesthood. Think of your book of Leviticus, the whole thing. And they were there as mediators between God and man. Again, a gracious provision that God has given us so that we could access God. But then the prophets speak of a new and more glorious priesthood. Isaiah 56. We don't have time to go there, but it speaks of a new Jerusalem. Isaiah 60 says much the same. Isaiah 65, and in there he says, foreigners, that would be all of us because there's probably not many Jewish people in here. Gentiles, Isaiah said, will not only come and be a part of the people of God, not only come and worship at the temple, Isaiah prophesies that there will actually be Gentile priests in this new and more glorious temple. And then Jesus comes and he makes us the priesthood. We are the priests. We don't have to go through any human mediator. We have access so we can go to the throne with boldness. We need no human priest. We are the priesthood. And then fourth, glory is a new and more glorious sacrifice. We read of the prophet Isaiah's vision. We read that in Isaiah 53 of this once for all sacrifice. So we need no longer make sacrifices. We don't have to kill bulls or goats, but we still do make spiritual sacrifices. A new and more glorious sacrifice. Sacrifice, and Peter actually mentions three of those. Flip a page and look at 1 Peter 2 5. Notice he speaks of a new and more glorious temple, priesthood, and sacrifice. 1 Peter 2 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, that is, temple. To be, you're not only the temple, you're the priests. To be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We could say so much more. I could go on all day. But we see that the prophets predicted not only the suffering of the Messiah, but the glories that he would bring about. A new exodus, new temple, new priesthood, new sacrifice. And then eighth and finally thing we learned from our three verses about the prophets is that they spoke to serve us. Look at verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told by you, by those who've preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. So we have a privileged perspective. God's always been good to his people, but can you imagine living in the times of exile in Babylon? or as a slave in Egypt, or even in first century Rome. But here we are in God's grace and kindness. You were born when you were born, and we have so much that we get to look back upon, so much revelation. And with that comes more responsibility, but it is a gift. We have a privileged perspective. We've seen all that God has done, all the promises that he has kept. Peter says the prophets searched intently and they investigated When would God make good on these? And we get to stand back and look and see how he has. Yet we should still do the same. We should investigate and inquire and learn more about this story and where we fit into it. But they were called to serve us. And if you know the prophets, it was a lonely ministry. They were often rejected, often persecuted. And we are on the receiving end of their difficult ministries. We ought to be humbled. We ought to be grateful. And ultimately, it should lead us, verse 3, to praise the Lord. 
It was for us, he says. The prophets spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who came and preached the gospel to you. So we are so privileged, privileged more than any prophet, even privileged more than John the Baptist. Jesus says as much in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, among those born of women, I think that pretty much covers it. Among those born of women, there's not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, I think the reason is because John the Baptist could look back on every other prophet. In some ways, he was the final prophet. Yet, Jesus says, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You, if you are a child of God, are more privileged, more blessed than John the Baptist because of how much you get to look back on that God has done. Just a couple chapters later, Jesus says this, Matthew 13, blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. So of all the times in past that we could have lived, we live on this side of so much of what God has done, so much of what the people of God have longed to see, and it should cause us to praise him and anchor our hope. In his goodness. Notice how he ends there, though, that little sentence there at the end of verse 12. Even angels long to look into these things. What things? Well, let's read verse 12 again. It was revealed to them they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things, that is, the glories of the gospel. The word here is peering in from without. It's the same word that's used in John when Mary peers into the empty grave looking for the body of Jesus. These angels are on tiptoes longing to look in to what you and I have experienced because they won't experience the gospel in the same way we do. We have a privileged perspective even over the angelic realm. These majestic, awesome creatures. I mean, I think we tend to think we would rather be an angel flying around, helping right in the throne room of God, being an encouragement, yet Peter tells us they are jealous of us. Angels long to look into the glories of the gospel because they don't know the joy, and they won't know the joy or the comfort or the assurance or the relief or the wonder of being a sinner saved by grace. But we do. So once again, Peter, as he's going to do week in and week out, is is rooting our identity in God's story and what God has already done because Peter knows things are hard and they're only getting harder. And so he says, persevere. Look, all the prophets spoke of is coming to fulfillment in Christ and you are experiencing it. This is your story. You are experiencing what they pointed to. God has kept his promises in history. Friend, he will keep his promises to you. So stay faithful to the king and praise him for his gracious plan.